So hello everyone, my name is Ryan Sokol and today I'm going to be talking about my group's recent developments at the intersection of additive manufacturing, integrated fluidic circuitry, and soft robotics. To provide some historical perspective, the field of robotics typically has revolved around hard materials like metals that are actuated using electronic means. But recently there's been a lot of interest in switching away from this and instead using compliant or flexible materials that are actuated using fluidic means like pneumatics or hydraulics. And they provide some inherent benefits in terms of adaptability as well as intrinsic safety. And so while this field is still relatively new, there have been a lot of developments over the last decade. And so it started out with a relatively fun demonstrations like this camouflage walking robot about 10 years ago has led to some pretty interesting biomedical applications. And so this example is a soft robotic glove that's designed to help people with certain types of physical ailments. And then this example here is a soft robotic heart sleeve that is designed to pump an ailing heart in a way that's biomimetic. But there have really been a broad number of applications of soft robots. But one of the things you might notice from all these examples is the significant number of control lines that are coming out of these soft robots. And the reason for this, because every single independent actuator or different degrees of freedom for each actuator are going to require a corresponding control line. And so in the microfluidics field, we're pretty familiar with this, uh, sometimes referred to as the tyranny of microfluidic interconnects. And so taking a page from the microfluidics community, the George Whitesides group, Jennifer Lewis group, and Rob Wood groups had the idea of taking an integrated microfluidic circuit and embedding it directly inside of a soft robot. And so this was a seminal work where they did this, and they put this inside of what was referred to as the Octobot. And while the functionality was, was kind of just a fun demonstration of the arms periodically moving up and down, this was a really important step in the field. Now this presented a couple of challenges. The first being that it becomes a little bit more challenging to create new functionalities by building different types of integrated fluidic circuits. And the next part is how to integrate these microfluidic circuits with soft robotic systems themselves. So overall, there are essentially two main pathways to doing this. The first is based on multi-layer soft lithography that certainly is familiar to many here. And so this particular component in this work was based on a prior fluidic circuit that was developed. And this uses a slightly more difficult multi-layer soft lithography process than I think many are used to. And that's because there are actually uh, features in the intervening membrane that also need to be aligned to the other layers. And then they applied a relatively wild manufacturing process that integrates a number of different techniques. We have CNC machining, we have multiple casting steps, we have 3D printing of sacrificial materials, and even once this is completed, it takes a thermal evacuation process to be able to evacuate the sacrificial material, and this itself requires a full five days to do. So members of this group uh, have continued working on these kind of methods, and so in this work from the Wood Group, they basically shifted to a 12-layer soft lithography process to be able to build this. I see some eyes being raised of, oh my goodness. And so as many of us know, and I believe Greg Nordine yesterday kind of covered some of this, there are a number of restrictions associated with these kinds of approaches. So there's the time, labor, and cost-intensive nature of these protocols. There's accessibility challenges as one needs access to microfabrication clean rooms and or certain types of equipment for these protocols. There are some challenges in terms of the manual alignment steps, right? To be able to align the different layers to one another accurately, which can be challenging in terms of repeatability. And then from a design perspective, we have to kind of be restricted to these moldable, typically rectangular geometries from layer to layer. And so that can limit the type of designs that we come up with for these systems. So to my knowledge, actually, these particular types of approaches since their publication have not seen any reports that have applied these types of methods since. And instead, we've seen a tremendous shift towards more macro scale, manual by hand assembly approaches, with the biggest one being the introduction of the soft bistable valve from the George Whitesides group. And so basically, the idea here is that by hand, you're gonna be building these soft bistable valves and then integrating them by hand also with other types of systems and soft robotic actuators. As a result, there have been some really interesting demonstrations in these last couple of years either using the soft bistable valve directly or by adapting it and extending it for some new functionalities. And this last example is probably the most up-to-date in terms of the state of the art. This came out about a little bit over a month ago. 
And while this doesn't use that bistable valve, here we're still showing this manual assembly process where all of these fluidic operators were put together by hand, connected by hand, and then connected to the soft robotic actuator, which is a soft robotic worm by hand. Many of these methods do a good job addressing some of the challenges in terms of cost and access while also enabling some new functional capabilities. But there are a number of challenges associated with the use of manual labor. And so we have difficulties in terms of repeatability, in terms of robot to robot, but also lab to lab. And then we're also gonna be limited in terms of miniaturization because if these have to be done by hand and by eye, there's only so small that these can be fabricated. And so our group has really been interested in shifting away from some of these methods and instead focusing on the use of new types of additive manufacturing strategies or 3D printing techniques to be able to build soft robotic systems that comprise fully integrated fluidic circuitry. So this is my lab's logo and it's meant to represent essentially like the three main candidates of types of additive manufacturing strategies that could be used. There are light-based 3D printing technologies, extrusion-based methods, and inkjet-based methods. And so I think when the term 3D printing is heard, in the general public at least, usually the first one thought of is, is something like this, these extrusion-based methods. And indeed, this is something that researchers have investigated as a pathway to build microfluidic circuit components like the quake valve shown here and, and the peristaltic pump underneath of it. My group has also done a bit of work using extrusion-based methods as well. In my view, uh, nicely, I would say that when it comes to different types of 3D printing techniques, extrusion-based methods offer the best material versatility of, of anything that really can be used. But the print speed is absolutely terrible, and there are some major restrictions in terms of the types of geometries and architectures that can be manufactured using this approach. And so at least in the microfluidics field, we've seen a lot more work focused on light-based 3D printing methods. In particular from the Folk Group, and as we heard yesterday from the Greg Nordine Group, there are a lot of methods based on VAT photopolymerization, like stereolithography or DLP-based methods. And as mentioned yesterday, there has been a lot of progress in terms of helping to miniaturize some of these technologies to the tens of microns range. But if miniaturization is important, there's really only one potential technology of interest, and that's two-photon direct laser writing. And so the way that this strategy is done is you have a tightly focused pulse laser and you're able to scan this rapidly inside of a photoreactive material. And what's special about it is that only the focal point is able to cure the material or solidify the material through two photon or multi-photon polymerization reactions. And so we've demonstrated this technology to be multi-material. But the two main takeaways that I want for all of you are that it is very rapid despite the scale and that the scales are truly unparalleled on the order of 100 nanometers. Because of that high feature resolution, it really doesn't make any sense to try to print entire microfluidic systems with it. So what my students did was they developed a process where you would take an enclosed microfluidic system and then you would 3D print the structures that absolutely demand its use. These are geometrically complex structures that cannot be manufactured any other way and print them directly inside of these channels and you would have full fluidic sealing to the channel walls at desired locations. Here you can see some examples, and, and this was originally motivated in terms of organ on a chip work, which we are doing, but I'm not presenting on today. Um, but you can see these interweaving vessels that have an inner diameter that's less than 10 microns. And if you were at Microtask 2019, you also saw that this process was compatible with electronic materials as well. And so that was something that we also published on recently. But today, I'm going to be talking about the use of this technology for fabricating microfluidic circuitry as well as soft actuators, and then as a pathway potentially to connect the two. So the overall manufacturing strategy has three steps. First, we're using direct laser writing outside of a chip, and we're just printing the microchannel mold directly onto a silicon wafer. Next, we're gonna be taking a thermoplastic, and we're gonna be thermally embossing it in order to replicate these channels. And then we're gonna bond it to have a fully enclosed microfluidic system. And then the last step is basically to infuse a photoreactive material into the microchannel itself. And then we're able to scan this laser point by point to cure the material to be able to build up these more complex three-dimensional structures at these scales. So we've demonstrated this for a number of different components. The one shown here, this is a normally open microfluidic transistor. And the one thing I want to highlight here is just you can see the bellowed microstructure, that cross-sectional view. It has a wall thickness that's a little bit smaller than one micron. But then in terms of the operation, you can see exactly how it works here, where it's able to close somewhat similar to a quake valve. We've also, using PDMS devices, demonstrated the ability for this, for examples like a microfluidic helical spring diode. But today, I'm gonna to be talking about some other elements. And so this is some work that my students have recently been doing. 
And the idea here is basically that we want to be able to print essentially these sets of soft actuators, these soft micro-robotic grippers. And then we also have two different types of microfluidic transistors. And they're nearly identical, but there's one geometric change that I'll, I'll be discussing. And so this is a cross-sectional view. And so there are a couple key components here to understand the functionality. One is that we have a free-floating ceiling disk. And so I mentioned the speed of this technology. And because of that speed, we're able to print this completely in midair without any types of support structures you would typically see using 3D printing. We also have this bellowed microstructure that has this micropost on top. So initially, when there's a source pressure, it's able to shift this disk down to seal atop the orifice and block fluid flow through the component. But if you apply a gate pressure of sufficient magnitude, it's able to inflate this bellowed microstructure to break that seal so fluid can now move through the component. And what was really interesting is we found that just by changing the diameter of that disk on top, the larger the diameter, the more force is required to overcome that seal and actually activate the transistor. So this is the manufacturing process for these particular components. At the top, you can see the soft microgrippers. At the bottom, you can see the microfluidic transistor. And then this is a false colored SEM, just again to highlight the scale at which we're printing these, right? So these, these actuators here are on the order of about 10 microns. And so here you can see an analogous circuit diagram next to the actual manufactured component. And so what we're doing is we're applying a constant source pressure at the bottom to both that is identical. And we have these two different transistors that the only difference is the diameter of that ceiling disk. And so under a low gate pressure, it's able to activate that very first transistor, but not the second. And as a result, only this very first set of microgrippers is able to close. But by increasing that gate pressure to a high pressure, now finally that second transistor is able to open and you're able to then close that next set of microgrippers. So here, basically, by controlling just a single control pressure, we can manage three different states for this system. So we were really excited by these results, but at the end of the day, in this example, we are 3D printing a couple different soft robotic actuators and some microfluidic transistors, but we're doing that inside of essentially a conventionally manufactured microfluidic system. And so another question we had was, because we try to print the entire system with all of the fully integrated microfluidic circuitry, the internal networks, the ports for all the macro to micro interfaces in a single print run as a fully united entity. And so to do this, we have to switch to a different technology for 3D printing, and this is called polyjet 3D printing. This is an inkjet based approach. It is a lot like a color printer, but instead of just printing one page, we're gonna be printing a page on top of a page on top of a page. And then another thing that's special about it is just like with a color printer, when you can have different colored inks next to one another that become integrated. Here we can have different materials that can be integrated together for each layer. And you can also have sacrificial support materials that can be water dissolvable and removed as you can see here. So previously we had demonstrated this for single material components. And so we demonstrated microfluidic capacitors, diodes, as well as different types of transistors. But there were some key limitations in terms of the use of only one material for these. And so we ended up shifting towards multi-material systems. But that was something that we had presented at Microsoft 2017. But we also proposed a different type of concept there. And then a year later, there was a paper out of George Whiteside's group where they specifically talked about this concept of printing a soft actuator, including the control elements, as one monolithic piece. And they specifically cited that prior work that I showed which I felt was a little bit of like an alley-oop to us. So we decided that we weren't gonna just do that. We wanted to print not just an actuator, we wanted to do the entire system. And so these are the students who have been working on this project. And the idea is basically to build different types of components and systems in computer-aided design or CAD software, integrate it fully within that CAD software, and then using this polyjet 3D printing process to be able to print compliant materials, rigid materials, and of course that support material to help it to be built. And so the particular circuit that I'm showing here, this is an oscillator circuit meant to resemble heavily the Octavot circuit from the beginning of this talk. And there are two key components that are making up this circuit. We have a fluidic diode and a fluidic transistor. And so for the fluidic diode, this is a one-way flow valve. It comprises a rigid casing. We have this free-floating disc like earlier, but now we're able to integrate a compliant material O-ring atop it. And so under a forward pressure, it's able to move down and flow is able to bypass it and go through the component. But when you reverse the flow polarity, it comes up and it interacts with this particular top orifice to block fluid flow. And one of the things that was interesting that we saw during testing was actually at higher pressures, it performs better 
as it's able to kind of compress the O-ring atop that top surface. We also demonstrated a fluidic transistor. And the idea here is basically we still have that rigid casing. We have that free floating disc. We now we have a micro post that's underneath it. We still have that O-ring like before. But we also have these compliant diaphragms that are connected by this intervening piston. So under a source pressure, this disc falls down and it blocks fluid flow. And so we have our first of three states. This is our closed state. Then by increasing the gate pressure a bit to a sufficient magnitude, it's able to basically push this particular component up to be able to make a pathway for fluid to be able to move through the components. We have our open state. But if you continue increasing this even further to a high pressure, it actually causes the diaphragm itself to begin interfacing with the bottom of the orifice, and we're able to reclose the component. And you can actually tune this behavior by changing the height of microposts located beneath that orifice. And so if you don't include any microposts, if the, the height is zero, it's going to look something like this, where basically as you increase that gate pressure, you see flow come in, and then flow drops out. But if you increase the height, what you end up seeing is that it ends up kind of limiting that reclosing function. So as you increase the gate pressure, it opens, and then it stays open for quite a bit. So to fabricate these components, we're using an Object 500 Connex 3 printer from Stratasys. There are a number of polyjet printers that would be suitable for this process. For the soft robotic turtle that I showed, we're talking about an eight hour process, but please note that is autonomous. You can press start and walk away. And afterwards, this is probably the most challenging aspect. You end up with a soft robot that is completely covered with this support material, and all of the internal voids, all of the microchannels, are filled with this support material. And while it is water soluble, diffusion is not the way to go for this. And so a lot of people see this and they hear about the support material, and it causes them tremendous anxiety. And I don't want any of you to feel that way today. And so I'm going to explain to you some of the tricks that we use so it is not a big deal to have the support material. So the first is that we modify our component designs. So instead of something like this, we add some extra channels so that we're able to manually displace the support material out of our components. And we do this through the entire system. There are four major steps to do this. So first, we manually just clear out the ports that we've made. So we have threaded ports for just macro to micro connections. So you can do this by hand. Then we have this process, like I just showed, where we're actually clearing these, these particular pathways out by hand. And there's only a few of them that need to be done, depending on the design. And then once that's done, you can then take these external port connectors and fasten them in to your system. We connect some tubing, and we connect this to a peristaltic pump. And then we're pumping a cleaning fluid through the entire circuit itself, or the soft robot. And then we're also immersing it in that cleaning fluid so that it's able to passively remove everything from the outside and the inside from your device, all of that support material away. For this particular component, this is the oscillator circuit by itself. This was about 25 minutes. If we're talking about the entire turtle that I'm showing, from the moment you press start on your 3D printer to having a working device in hand, this is less than 24 hours. And only 60 minutes of that is manual labor. But at the end, you get a robot like this. And so here, we were trying to replicate that oscillating functionality of the Octobot. And so you can see how this is working here. So we were really excited by these results uh, without question. But there was another thing that kind of stuck out to us in that George Whiteside's paper. And they specifically call out the issues with quake-type valves. And they say how it's not straightforward to achieve a large pressure gain. So we wondered if we could apply this strategy to overcome that deficit. The idea we had was to create these gain-based fluidic circuits based on these normally open type fluidic transistors with pressure gain functionalities. And so here, it's going to look very similar to what we've talked about. We have a rigid casing, this O-ring on top, we have an intervening piston, and we have these compliant diaphragms. And so initially, there is source to drain flow coming from the top to the side. And then we have this gate pressure on the bottom. But what's interesting in this case is you can see that the top and the bottom are different sizes. And so we have this force balance on the piston in the center. And this is related to the pressure in each chamber times the area. And this top region has a smaller area than the bottom region. So what that means is that even if the top pressure is higher than the bottom pressure, that gate pressure, it's still able to overcome that and close the valve. And this idea of a lower pressure overcoming a higher pressure is referred to as pressure gain. And so here's an example of what this looks like, where basically the top region is identical 
But you can see how even an identical gate pressure is going to cause different behaviors in each, just depending on how large that gate region diaphragm is. And so the first one's able to close at a lower pressure, the second one closes at a medium pressure, and then the one that's a one-to-one -one ratio takes quite a bit more pressure to close. And so we can integrate that with soft robotic actuators. And so we have this exhaust port here, where basically if you apply that source pressure, it comes out. But if you activate this gate, it's able to close, and the pressure has nowhere else to go but to inflate these fingers, these knuckles that we have designed. So this is what it looks like in real life. And what we're going to see here in this video is basically we're going to be increasing the gate pressure little by little. And the Kim wipe that we have at the back, you're going to see that it's going to be blown a little bit less as time goes on, and the finger is going to begin deflecting. But the main thing that I want you to take away here is that if you were looking to generate a force of 100 millinewtons with each of these different fingers, depending on the transistor that you're using, you can have this happen at completely different pressures. So we took advantage of this and we designed a uh, soft robotic hand, if you will, and we have four different states. So in the absence of a gate pressure, nothing happens. If you apply a low gate pressure, only that first transistor with a very large gate diameter begins to close and you're able to get that first finger to press down. For a medium pressure, you now have two fingers, and then for the high pressure, every single finger is now touching its corresponding button on the Nintendo controller. And so we were able to print this using our technology, and because the height is much smaller than that turtle, we're looking at a print time of roughly three and a half hours, but certainly under four hours. And after your process of removing the support material, we have something that looks like this. And so what you're seeing here in this blue region, you're going to be able to see the different pressures that are inputted into the system. We have a source pressure that's designed to remain constant, and we have that gate pressure that's going to be going from off to low to medium to high. And that's going to be able to actuate these different fingers, which in turn is going to control Mario. So with uh, great success, my students were able to beat Mario with this, at least the first, the first level. One part that I want to really highlight is our GitHub, where we are freely providing all of our CAD and STL files from this work. And so with that, we looked at two different approaches for making soft robotic systems that are integrated with fluidic circuitry. The first, at smaller scales, is the use of direct laser writing to 3D print these soft micro robotic grippers that are interfaced with these fluidic transistors. And they were able to control the closing behaviors based on a single gate pressure at different magnitudes. And then at a slightly larger scales, we have the use of polyjet 3D printing, where we were able to print the entire soft robotic systems, including the fluidic circuitry, the interconnects, the body features, everything, in a single print run without any assembly required. And they were able to use this to beat Super Mario Brothers level one by regulating that gate pressure from off to low to medium to high. I want to thank all of our funding sponsors who contributed to this work. I also want to thank Terrapin Works, the 3D printing hub on campus, who handle a lot of the 3D printing. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions.